Let's deal with this assertion reason problem. So what is statement one? Consider an object that floats in water but sinks in oil. So basically this object has a density more than the density of oil, but its density is less than that of water, right? When the object floats in water with half submerged, if oil is slowly poured into the water till it completely covers the object, the object moves up. And what is statement two? As the oil is poured in the situation of statement one, pressure inside the water will increase everywhere, resulting in an increase in upward force on the object. So let's assume that this height, which is inside water, is h. Okay? And the area of the top and bottom flat surface is, let's say, A. Now, who is balancing the force of gravity, mg, acting on this object downwards? Well, the force due to the difference in pressure is going to balance this force for the equilibrium of this object, right? So, the force acting on the top surface of this object is the atmospheric pressure P0 into area of cross section A. And the force that is acting on this object from below is P0 plus rho water GH into A. And the difference in pressure, which is rho W GH into the area, is equal to M into G. Right? Now, as the oil is poured, then don't you think, due to the weight of the additional layer of oil, the pressure at this point is going to increase? Right? And if the pressure increases, the force will increase. And there is going to be an upward additional force that will act on this object. And this is why this object is going to move up. Right? So in this case, statement 1 is right. Statement 2 is also right. And statement 2 is the correct explanation of statement 1. So you can take option A as the right option for this problem. There is 20 gram of ice at minus 10 degrees Celsius, which is to be mixed with m gram of steam at 100 degrees Celsius. But there is some condition. You have to find out the minimum value of m so that finally all ice and steam converts into water. And you can use the values given in this problem statement. So the question is simple. But there is one thing that you need to figure out to ultimately solve this problem. So basically, I want you to find out at what temperature should the water be at. Should it be at 0 degrees Celsius or should it be at 100 degrees Celsius? Remember, you have to find out the minimum value of M. And M is the mass of the steam from which the heat is taken and this heat is utilized to melt the ice. So think about it. Should the water that is obtained ultimately be at 0 degree Celsius or should it be at 100 degree Celsius such that the value of M is minimized? Okay. Think about it this way. If you want the minimum value of M, you need to make sure that the amount of heat that is given by the steam as it cools down is sufficient to melt the ice. Not just melt, but to bring its temperature lower first and then melt it. Now, in which case do you think more heat will be obtained? If the steam cools down from 
100 degree Celsius at vapor phase to 100 degree Celsius at water phase or it further cools down to 0 degree Celsius. Well, yes. The temperature of the water should be 0 degree Celsius and in this case, the value of M will be minimized, right? Because you can obtain more heat when you get the water at 0 degree Celsius from the steam as compared to when the water is at 100 degree Celsius. Make sense, right? So basically, we answered a really crucial question, which is essential in finding out the value of M. So we want the water to be at 0 degree Celsius and the premise is simple. The heat lost by steam should be equal to the heat gained by ice. Right? So we are assuming the mass of the steam to be m gram. Okay? So first the steam will come from the vapor phase to the water phase. Right? So this is going to be the energy which is released in this process is going to be M into L vapor, which is the latent heat of vaporization. That is 540. So we are done with this part. And then the water at 100 degrees Celsius will come to water at 0 degrees Celsius. And in that process, the heat released will be M. And what is the specific heat capacity of water? Well, that is 1. So this is 1 and the change in temperature is going to be 100, right? From 100 to 0. So we have figured out what is the LHS of this equation. Now let's focus on the right hand side. The mass of ice is how much? Well, the mass of ice is 20 gram. So this is 20. So we can take mass of ice common, okay? So 20 is taken common. What is the specific heat capacity of ice? So this is 0.5 or you can say 1 by 2. So as ice at minus 10 degrees Celsius is, is gaining heat and the temperature is increasing, then when the ice comes to 0 degrees Celsius, then this is the heat required. So this is going to be half into 10 plus and what is L melt, which is the latent heat of melting. Well, this is 80. So this is 80. And we are done. So we just have to simplify this out. So on the left hand side, we have 640 into M. On the right hand side, we have 20 into 85. And clearly from here, the value of M comes out to be 85 divided by 32. And don't forget, it is in gram. So in this case, option C must be right. As you can see, two springs A and B are under the same stretching force. The stiffness of spring A is K and the, and the stiffness of spring B is 2K. Given that the energy stored in the spring A is 10 joules, you have to find out how much energy is stored in a spring B. Simple, right? So we know that the energy stored is in the form of elastic potential energy. And in the case of the springs, that is half k x square. So first let's find out what is the extension in spring A. So we have, in this case, F will be equal to k into x, let's say x1, right? And x1 comes out to be F by k. So that the value of E, which is the energy stored in this spring, is half k x1 square. That is F square by k square. And 1k will be gone. So this is just k. Right? Now how about the extension in the spring B? Well, let's say this is x2. Where this time F is 2k x2. Right? So x2 comes out to be F divided by 2k. And the energy, let's say E dash stored in this spring is going to be half into 2k into x2 square. That is F square by 
k square, right? So from here we have this as f square divided by 4k, right? But f square divided by 2k is e, which means that e dash is e divided by 2, right? And how much is e? Well, the energy stored is 10 joule, which means that e dash is 5 joule. And this is the energy stored in the spring B. So there you go, as simple as that, we found out that in this case, option B must be the right option. So you have to tell which quantity remains unchanged as the wave changes its medium. And I know you are smiling because you know that the answer to this simple problem is frequency, right? So the frequency depends upon how the source is creating the disturbance. And it might happen that the disturbance is produced in air, but the wave is traveling in water also, right? Think about, let's say, sound wave. So the wave can travel in any medium, but that doesn't change how the source is producing the waves. And that is why, in this simple case, you can tick option D as the right option. Now, this pulse is reflected twice. First, from the fixed end A, and second, from the free end B. You have to tell what is going to be the shape of the wave pulse after these two reflections. And you have to choose the right option out of these given options. So in the first reflection, you can see that this is similar to a wave traveling in the rarer medium and reflected by the denser medium, right? So two things are going to happen. One is that the reflected wave pulse would be moving towards left after the reflection. And the second thing that is going to happen is that the reflected wave pulse will be inverted. Or you can say, there is going to come a phase difference of pi between the reflected wave pulse and the incident wave pulse. Agreed? So after the first reflection from the fixed end A, the wave pulse is going to look like this. The part of the wave pulse that reaches the fixed end first will be reflected first. And you can see that the shape of the wave pulse is like that. Agreed? And now after the second reflection from the free end, the wave pulse would be moving towards right and there will be no phase difference between the reflected wave pulse by the free end B and the incident wave pulse. Right? So after the second reflection, the wave pulse is going to look like this. So we have our answer in this case, you can see that the wave pulse shown in option B will be the right shape of the reflected wave pulse.